All right, good morning, everyone. I, uh, I hope you guys are having a great morning. Um, I am so excited to welcome you to a Learn with an Expert program with the Milwaukee Public Museum. Um, my name is Maisie. I am a teacher here at the museum. And uh, I am so excited to be joined with Dr. John Hawks. He is an anthropologist at uh, the University of Wisconsin up in Madison. And um, we are so excited to have him today. Just a couple little housekeeping reminders. Um, reminder that this is best suited for grades six through 12. And uh, it's probably gonna last about an hour. So you are welcome to and encouraged to please ask questions in the YouTube chat. You can log in with a Google account. Uh, we'll be answering questions um, there and I'll be asking Dr. Hawks those questions as well. And um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Like I said, we have Dr. Hawks here um, and I'm gonna let him take it away. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much, Maisie. Listen, guys, I'm an anthropologist, and what I study is ancient humans and ancient relatives of humans, how they're related to us, and how we evolved from them. So I'm looking at the distant human past. I'm going to talk today about some of the fossil uh, discoveries that I've been involved with and that I work on, including this skull, uh, which is the skull of a species called Homo naledi. So I'll talk about how we discover fossils and the teamwork that we have uh, in our projects to discover fossils and to understand them scientifically. But I'm also gonna talk about the big picture of where we came from. Um, how do we understand the human past? How do we understand ancient forms of humans that are different from us today and, and our differences from them, but how our species evolved from them? So I'm going to start this uh, by sharing my screen and giving you guys uh, some pictures. So let me start this here and we'll start here. Okay, so a lot of people maybe don't know that the record of ancient humans and our fossil relatives is really large. Uh, this is a display that's at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. Uh, this is the National Museum of Natural History. And you can see that this is a wall and it's just covered with skulls. And these skulls come from all parts of the world. Uh, we have records of ancient humans in every part of the world that humans live today. In some parts of the world, those records go back millions of years. In other parts of the world, the record goes back many thousands of years. Um, because that's when ancient humans began to inhabit those parts of the world. In North America here, we have really deep records of ancient human groups that lived here within the last 15,000 years, and that's a very long time. The fossils that I study go back hundreds of thousands and millions of years ago. And to give you some perspective, if you think about your mother, your grandmother, you know, if you're going one generation at a time and, and hold hands, right? So that you're holding hands with your mother, her with, her grand, with your grandmother, et cetera, and think how many people going back in time would this be? If we go back to 25,000 years ago, so a time period that, you know, the world is still in, the, in an ice age and giant walls of ice are here in Wisconsin, right? that's about a thousand people holding hands. And you can imagine what a thousand people is, right? It's, it's, it's not a giant number. It is something that you could probably find in your town. And if you imagine a link taking you back into the past, that's how many people we'd be talking about. I study fossils that are 250,000 years ago. That's 10,000 people holding hands and some fossils that are as old as two and a half million years ago. So that's 100,000 people holding hands. This starts to look like a really long time. And it is a really long time. It's a long time during which many changes have taken place. Now, this wall I put on here to remind me that fossils represent some parts of the body, right? They represent the hard tissues, the bones, 
we very rarely have fossils of any other part of the body, any soft tissue, because they tend to decay really soon after death. Hard tissues, the bones and the teeth last a long time. Our record is biased in some ways. We have a lot of skulls and a lot of teeth because those parts, not only are they very hard and they preserve really well, but also they are really distinctive in humans compared to other kinds of primates and other kinds of mammals. So when we find a tooth by itself, we can usually tell what kind of creature it is. Even so, we do have lots of fossils that represent much more of the body. And this slide shows you some of the skeletons that we have of species that are two million, two and a half million years old of human relatives. Um, that includes species like Australopithecus operensis that's on the left of the screen, species like Australopithecus sediba on the right of the screen. These are species that lived two million years ago, three million years ago. What I wanna emphasize about these species is that all of them, every one of them that we've found lived in Africa more than 2 million years ago. Our species, Homo sapiens, has an African origin. All of our fossil ancestors and relatives before 2 million years ago were African fossils. And our closest living relatives, chimpanzees and gorillas, are modern great apes. They live today, they live in Africa. So our species has an African origin. If we look at the record of fossil humans and fossil human relatives, it forms a tree. One of the really fundamental realities about the study of our relationships with other species today and other species in the past is that we form a tree. A tree means that we didn't descend from every one of these species that we know about we have common ancestors with them. In many cases, we know who those common ancestors might've been, but in many cases we don't. So I've shown this tree and the present day in evolutionary trees is often at the top of the screen and the distant past is often at the bottom. And that mirrors the way that rock layers form. The deepest rocks are the oldest and the, and the most recent rocks are, are at the top. So when we look at a tree of relationships of today's humans that I've got up here with other fossils, two things that I wanna emphasize about this. One of them is that we have discovered a lot of ancient relatives of ours. We have relatives of ours that are very much like us today, like the Neanderthals. Um, we have relatives that are really different from us. Uh, the species called Homo floresiensis is an example of that. And what I'm going to try to do is to take us into a couple of these species and talk a little bit about the kinds of evidence that we have about ancient humans and how we understand their lives. In the past, and what I mean here is the recent past, 100 years ago, people used to hear about fossil ancestors of humans, fossil relatives of humans, and they thought they're really different from us in lots of ways. Um, uh, on the left of this screen, I have this picture of what people used to think a Neanderthal looked like. But it's very difficult to tell from bones what somebody's physical appearance was other than their bone structure, right? And so when we look at ancient fossils, there's an exercise of creativity that we use to try to place them into what we can understand. We could go too far in some cases. On the right of this screen, you can see that here's this same ancient human, this Neanderthal, in totally 1950s era garb, right? And the question is, if this person sat next to you on the subway, would you notice that they were some, something really different from you? Well, today, we use lots of means of evidence to try to understand the overall biology of ancient people. And artists use some really detailed data sets on people and living primates to try to reconstruct their physical appearance. And I find it really important to look at artist reconstructions to place ourselves in a spot where we can go beyond the bones and try to use our imaginations to think about what ancient people were like. Ancient people, ancient relatives of ours 
were parents. They were children. They had families. They loved each other. They smiled. They laughed. They lived lives that were like ours today in many, many ways and different from ours in some really important ways, right? They lived without the kinds of technologies that we rely on today, right? They didn't have cars, they didn't have phones, they didn't have computers. They also didn't have refrigerators. They didn't have ways of storing food for a long time. They didn't have ways of relying on foods that they didn't have to get their day to day. That made their lives really different from most of us today. They appreciated beauty around them. We know that this is true because sometimes they marked on themselves and on other things with pigments. Sometimes they collected objects that they thought were special. So they were living in worlds that they appreciated the things around them. They talked with each other about the things around them and they learned from each other. They often lived in some really harsh places, places that would have been very difficult to live without technology. I think of Wisconsin as one of those places, honestly. This would be a very difficult place to live in the wintertime without lots of you know, ability to create warm clothing, to live in warm places, to have fires, to keep yourselves warm, right? to be able to, to go on the landscape and find food and cook food. Um, that takes enormous ingenuity and cultural abilities. And ancient humans and human relatives had those. So when we look at their bones and when we try to, to work out, right, what do these people look like? How are they connected to us? We're using many kinds of data. And some of those kinds of data are what we understand and know about today's people. Anthropologists like me study the ways of life of people all around the world to try to understand how do they make it on their different lifestyles? How do they get enough calories in the day to be able to, to survive? How do they feed their children? What is the me means of, of political organization in people with different kinds of groups, right? So those are all things that we can't understand directly from bones but that our understanding of the variability among people gives us a way of, of looking at. But we also look at the way that today's people and recent historic people have used technologies, the way that they interact with each other, and the way that the food that they eat affects them and the way that it affects their bones. There are some ancient archaeological sites where we find fossil humans, where we have many, many of them. A really good example of that is the site that I'm gonna talk about a little bit later, uh, the Rising Star Cave, where I work in South Africa. But an even bigger example is this site in Spain called the Cima de los Huesos. The Cima de los Huesos is a really good example of the kind of information that we can get from the past. In this cave, more than 30 individuals of an ancient group called the Neanderthals were thrown into a deep pit inside of a cave. They were dead when their bodies were put into the pit. Some of them had been killed by other people, by other individuals. And we know this because we see the wounds, the trauma that's on some of their skulls. So, so we know that they met a violent end in some cases. We have almost all of the bones of these 30 people in this pit. So we know a lot about their biology and a lot about their variation. When we look at how we reconstruct their population, their group, they represent men and women, children of all ages. And we don't know if all of them knew each other when they were alive or if they were members of different groups but they lived within an area, within a population. And it's very likely that most of them knew each other. When we find their bones, however, we find them in a state of disarray. 
And when you see an archaeological site, we dig very carefully and very slowly in archaeological sites to discover exactly the positions where things are in the ground. And we use that information to understand something about what has happened. Who were the groups that lived in this place? How are their bones connected with technology? How are their bones connected with the, the way that they lived? In the Cima de los Huesos, the bones are just bones. They're all together in this place and there's not a lot of evidence of life around them. In some other situations, we know much more about the surroundings of, of ancient individuals than we know about them through their bones. This bone is from a place in Russia, which is called Denisova Cave. Denisova Cave is a really special place. I've been there a number of times. It is a very cold cave. It is in the Altai Mountains in Russia, and the average temperature inside the cave all year round is just over freezing. This means that although we have very few bones of ancient humans from this cave, there's many bones of other animals, there's tools that were made by ancient humans, there's deposits in the cave that go back as early as 300,000 years, and some deposits that are only a couple thousand years old. One of the really special things about this cave is that the very few human bones that we have preserve the DNA inside of them. So you have DNA inside every cell in your body and that DNA is essential to your body's working, right? It also carries the information that makes it possible to create you know, a new body. So your DNA is like an instruction set for your cells to do what they do. And that includes grow into an individual like you are. The DNA also preserves a history of your ancient relatives. You inherited your DNA from your parents. They inherited it from their parents and so on. And so as you go back further and further in time, you are sampling lines of ancestry that go back for most of us to different parts of the world. And those different parts of the world are all connected to each other in the past and create a tree that we can understand the relationships of today's populations. And when we find ancient DNA inside of ancient bones, ancient populations. We have DNA today from ancient groups like the Neanderthals who lived more than 40,000 years ago. This bone from Denisova cave is here on the outline of, of a hand, right? And you can see it there, it's by the pinky, the, the small finger this bone is sitting there, that's because this little piece of bone is the end of one of the pinky bones. And that little piece of bone has this line that's going across it. And that line is a really special piece of information for us as anthropologists, because that line is the growth line. That's where the bone was still growing. Adults have these lines totally sealed so that you know, their bone isn't growing anymore, but children have the bone with a line there because it's growing. And that line means that this was a child's bone. This bone belonged to an individual who was a young girl when she died, and she belonged to a population that was really different from today's people and really different from the Neanderthals in their DNA. This group had never been recognized before by anthropologists when the DNA was sequenced in, in the year 2010. So this is only 12 years ago, and it is a new group that we never knew about before. Because we found them in Denisova Cave, uh, we call them Denisovans. And it's a group that's very different from us today and very different from Neanderthals. Here's the landscape outside of Denisova Cave. And here's the excavation inside of Denisova Cave. And you can see that there are these, what we call sediment layers, but you might call them dirt inside of the cave. And they have tools and bones and other remains of ancient humans in them. And also the ancient animals that were using the cave. That includes hyenas. One of the cool things about the Denisova Cave is the hyena activity that's preserved and the hyena coprolites which are poops 
that the hyenas left in the cave. So DNA enables us to look at the relationship between ancient groups. And I'll show you that in this tree, we today are at the bottom of the graph. Um, and these are five different groups of today's people. And that includes people in France, people in China who are called Han ethnic group, uh, people in Africa, including Yoruba people from Nigeria and San people from, from uh, South Africa, and also Papuan people from New Guinea. These are five different groups from different parts of the world. And they're in this graph to show you that all of their relationships are very close to each other. And they're very different from these other people, Neanderthals, and very different from this Denisovan. But what one thing that we have learned from ancient DNA is that all of these ancient groups of people were interbreeding with each other and they influenced each other for, for many hundreds of thousands of years. Okay, so that's kind of an overview of the way that we study archeological sites, some of the kinds of evidence we get from ancient bones and the way that we can study ancient DNA today to get ideas of ancient relationships. Now I wanna to turn to talking about the work that I do in South Africa. And all of the work that I do is uh, in part with a team of people that, are, that include people from many different kinds of scientific specialties and many different kinds of other work specialties. Um, so here's a photo of some of the team at the Rising Star site that I'm gonna talk about. And you can see that they're, they're all in caving gear because we work underground. And I wanted to share you, with you the team first to let you know that all of the science that we do is teamwork. We're working with lots of people, some of them young, some of them older, um, many of them in my site are South African, but many of them are also international. Um, and all of them have knowledge and experience that they're bringing in because we all have to work together to understand these ancient fossils that we find in the sites. Okay, I'm gonna start talking about this cave and the work that I do by showing you a couple of videos. And these videos don't have sound, and so I'm going to talk you know, over them. I want to talk about the fossils that we discovered in the cave system and how we came to make a discovery and how difficult it is for our team to work in this cave. So this guy is Stephen Tucker, and he's a cave explorer that has worked with our team. The video that, that this is is being taken by his friend, Rick Hunter, and both of them made a discovery in 2013. And this discovery you're gonna see as Stephen climbs down into this really narrow crack in the cave, he climbs down to the bottom of it and on the floor of the cave are bones. This is the camera from his helmet. And this is the first time, right, that, that he's seeing the bones. And you can see right here on the floor of this cave, there is a skull that is there embedded in the floor of the cave. Here's a jawbone that was on the floor of the cave when they first entered this deep chamber. This jawbone when they brought photographs out of the cave and showed my friend Lee, and I'll talk about Lee in a second, and, and those of us who were sharing the photos, we saw that this jawbone looks like a human jawbone in some ways. It's the right half of a jaw. Um, and you can see that the teeth here are worn, but the sizes of the teeth and the shapes of the teeth told us that this is some kind of human relative. And that was really special because this kind of discovery isn't made very often. Steve and Rick were in this cave hoping that they might find some bones or something interesting. And they were working with us and they were hoping, hey, maybe there's bones in this cave. They had never seen bones in this cave before. And the reason is, although lots of cavers were in this cave a lot, there, this cave has two kilometers or more than a mile and a half of passageways underground. Some of them are super narrow 
And that means that the po folks who like to go into deep caves, they really like to go in this cave because there were lots of narrow places to go through. Um, they hadn't noticed bones in the cave before. The reason they hadn't noticed the bones is because those bones that they saw were in this deep part of the cave called the Dinaletti chamber. We named it Dinaletti. It didn't have a name before because it hadn't been discovered before. The reason it hadn't been discovered is that it was at the bottom of this really narrow passageway. We call this passageway the chute. When Stephen wedged himself into the top of that passageway and noticed that his feet weren't touching something, he decided to explore down it. It is 18 centimeters wide. That is seven and a half inches. And it is 40 feet high. So the climb is very far and the width of the passage is very narrow. I wanna show you in a second, let me just, I'm gonna go forward a bit and show you what it is like to climb up this chute. So what you see here is Becca Peixado. Becca is one of our team members and she's climbing the very base of the chute and above her is Marina Elliott. And Marina is going to pass Becca the camera in a second. And so you can see Marina climb through the narrowest part of this. So Becca is going to wedge herself into the rock here. And now you see the camera turn. And here is Marina. And Marina is taking the next bit of this. Working in the cave system where we work requires an enormous amount of skill. You have to be pretty athletic to be able to do these climbs. You also, as you can see, have to be kind of small. And I can tell you that I am too big to fit into the cave system where, where these bones are found. The next passage you're going to see is the top of the chute looking downwards. And Ellen Fuyrigal, who is a team member from Australia, is going to take the last part of this. We find bones in sometimes very difficult to reach places. One of the things that keeps bones safe for thousands of years is being in places where the outside environment doesn't erode and doesn't change very fast. And so this is one of the places in this cave system where we're able to find bones. You can see that this is a really physical task and it takes a, a, a really a lot of skill. And if you think about what it would be like to be in a super narrow place against hard rock and climbing, that is sometimes really scary. And I can tell you that it takes a lot of bravery to be able to work in places where, where we have bones in the cave system. So this all began in 2013. And my friend Lee Berger, who is a National Geographic explorer, and he's also a professor in South Africa at a university called the University of Witwatersrand, um, Lee organized a team of people to excavate in the cave. In our first excavations, uh, that team was drawn from archaeology students from many different parts of the world, including here in Wisconsin. Uh, Alia Gertov, on the, the second from the left in this shot, it was a student at the University of Wisconsin at the time that we worked in the cave. Um, today, the team includes mostly South African scientists, including Kenaloy Molopiane, who is our current director underground in the cave system. So in 2013, when we began working in the cave system, you saw the same photos that I saw when we started working of bones in the cave. We knew that it was some kind of human relative, but we didn't know what it was when we started working. And we didn't know really what to expect. We thought when we began that we would probably be finding part of a skeleton. And I showed you skeletons earlier and they are super important to us, right? Understanding the skeleton is the way that we understand ancient species. And so we knew that it was gonna be an important discovery. But 
as the team began working in this deep chamber, Hannah Morris at the top here is using a brush to brush sediment off of these bones. And Marina Elliott here is brushing sediment into a spoon and taking sediment out. Um, as they began working, you can see that there were a lot of bones. This was many more than we expected to find. During the course of the next few months of excavation, we uncovered more than 1,500 bone fragments and pieces of hominin, of human relative. This was one of the largest discoveries that anyone had ever made of a human relative anywhere in the world. But that took a lot for us to try to understand what was going on, right? First, we had a mystery. Why were there so many bones of this ancient, you know, whatever it is, deep in this cave system, right? How did they get there? Second, what is it? Um, what kind of species was it? How was it connected to us? To understand those things, we had to use our methods to prepare the bones so that we could study them. And that means conserving them so that they are, they're hardened so that we can work on them safely. And then we had to understand their anatomy. We've done some extraordinary things in the cave system to understand the overall, you know, what's going on. Um, here's a bunch of Homo naledi bones that we would cover in plaster and take out of the cave system so that we could study them outside in the laboratory. We've worked in parts of the cave system to try to understand how Naledi could have entered and exited these parts of the cave system. Yes, I'm telegraphic, right? Because Naledi is the name of the species. We found these thousands of bones, we studied them, and we compared them with every other kind of fossil that we had found before. And what we learned is that these fossils were different from other human relatives in ways that set them apart as something different that we hadn't discovered. For that reason, we named this as a new species. We called it Homo naledi. In the language Sesotho, which is spoken in this part of Southern Africa, this word naledi means star. And we named it naledi because the rising star cave where we work. Naledi is a really great name. Homo naledi means that it's a relative of today's humans, Homo. And naledi means it's a different species from today's humans. Over time, we learned a lot about Homo naledi. We learned that the bones entered the cave and were deposited in the cave sometime between 236,000 years ago and 335,000 years ago. That's 250, they're about hundreds of thousands of years. That's a long time ago, but it's also a time when we know that in Africa, ancestors of ours, modern to today's people, Homo sapiens, were already living. So Homo naledi lived at a time when our ancestors also lived. We found really amazing parts of the naledi body all together so that we can understand that these parts belong to an individual or a different individual. An example is this hand. On the left side, you can see the hand in the sediment in the cave. You can see the parts of the hand arranged like a hand, right? And, and bent over like this, articulated. And this hand, as we studied it, revealed that Naledi's wrist was very much like the wrists of people today. Its fingertips were very much like today's people's fingertips, very broad. And that means that they can apply a lot of force across their fingertips when they're gripping onto things with their fingertips. That's something that we see in today's people because we're great at gripping things to use as tools. And we think that this is also what Naledi was doing. But you can also see on the right of this screen that his finger bones were very curved. And the, the little ridges that run on the sides of these finger bones, you can see are actually quite strong. And that means that their, their hands were very strong, their tendons that, that allow them to grip things were strong, and the curvature indicates that they were probably using their hands for climbing. In addition, Naledi had some features that we don't see in people today. 
Um, for example, the bone of the palm that is beneath your thumb, this, this first metacarpal, we call it, has a very broad end and narrow base by your wrist. And it has these really large ridges on it. That's something that we don't see in today's people and we haven't seen in any other form of primates. This is something that's actually pretty unique to Naledi. And we don't fully understand why its thumb is built in this way, but we can say that its thumb was big and powerful. Its feet are shaped like human feet today. And that includes an arch in their feet. And the bottom of the screen from the side of the foot, you can see the arch. And on the right side, you can see the arch that's made by the metatarsals in the foot. This is the ends of the metatarsals and you can see that they make an arch. This is something that human feet have because the arch keeps our foot strong when we step on it and actually flexes slightly so that the ligaments can absorb energy when you step. That's a really important aspect of human walking. The other important aspect is the big toe, which in Naledi you can see here is proportioned like today's human's big toes, right? So we know that Naledi was walking like we do, upright. But Naledi was really different from us today in some ways, including this small brain size. So here's a Naledi skull. We flipped it with a mirror so that you can see the overall shape of it. And you can see that it's got this brow ridge and its skull is about a third the size of ours. My friend, John Gurchy, who is an artist who tries to reconstruct the appearance of ancient fossils, he uses information from autopsies of people and from dissections of other mammals and, and apes to try to understand how the soft tissue relates to the, the bone. And he's probably the best at using anatomy to guide what an ancient, ancient relative of ours would have looked like. This is what he thinks Naledi looked like. And some parts of this, like the arrangement of the hair and probably the pigmentation of the skin, these are things that he uses comparisons with today's people that live in the same parts of the world to get an idea, right? Because pigmentation and hair are ways that today's people adapt to the environments that they live in. But that's naturally speculation when we apply it to an ancient fossil. What is less speculative is the form of the muscles and skin over the bones. Um, and for example, the very flat nose that Naledi has, which is sort of, you know, a, a very different feature from today's people, um, the brow and the way that's shaped, these are things that are really directly in the bone that we have. So we can say, hey, this is, this is actually pretty different from us in those respects. Across its skeleton, we have information from many individuals of Naledi. And one of the most important things that we know is that we have individuals of many different ages in the cave. That ranges from very young children. At the top left, we have teeth, and these are just deciduous teeth, baby teeth of an individual. So this is a very young individual. And at the bottom right, we have a jawbone and the upper teeth that are super worn down, right? These teeth are worn down to the roots. So this is an individual that has lived a long life and their teeth have actually worn out. Um, and we have individuals of every age in between. Shortly after we discovered the Dinaletti chamber and its bones, our team continued to explore in the cave system and discovered a second chamber, a chamber called the Lesetti chamber. And this chamber also had bones. That included the bones of this individual on the left. And I have his skull here with me. Um, this is a copy of the skull. This individual is a skeleton named Neo. What this told us is that Naledi was using the cave. Right? How did Naledi get into the cave? We can say Naledi was using the cave. They were familiar with many parts of the cave system and their bodies, we find them in different parts of the cave system. So we know Naledi was using the cave. I mentioned earlier that Naledi was living at the same time as some early members of our species. And I'm putting another fossil here next to the Naledi skull. This fossil is from Ethiopia. That's in Northeastern Africa, and it's quite far away from South Africa where I work. 
but these fossils are about the same age. They lived at about the same time. So Naledi was living in some parts of Africa at the same time that Homo sapiens was living in other parts of Africa. The biggest difference between these that's obvious is that Homo sapiens today, we have big brains and Naledi had brains about a third our size. So they were very different from each other in probably their lifestyles and the way that they lived. Okay. Um, what I'd like to do is to sort of stop there and provide space for you guys to ask questions about Homo naledi, about the fossil record, how we discover human ancestors, about the way that we, you know, try to understand the past, and about, you know, anything that you have interest about in the way that ancient humans lived and how they're related to us. So, I'll give you, you know, a, a, some time. Please share those questions in the chat, and I'll have Maisie come back on, and uh, and she can maybe get us started. Yeah, absolutely. I want to thank you. I was enjoying learning more as well. Um, so I'm actually curious. This is not so much specifically about Homo naledi, um, but I'm a little bit curious about how. Um, you know, what attracted you to anthropology and maybe how some people might get into anthropology. I know you've had a lot of, um, a lot of different people work at that site and everybody has a different, uh, piece of expertise. So how do so many different types of people get into, get into anthropology? That is such a great question. Um, we are a very interdisciplinary type of science. I mean, most of you who are out there watching, right, you don't have anthropology classes in your schools. And you maybe have learned in a biology class something about evolution, something about ancient people, maybe in an ancient history class or ancient civ class, you have a little bit about, you know, ancient people. And that those are really different classes, right? <laughs> and so you get the idea that, well, this is connected to history, it's connected to archaeology, it's connected to geology, the real deep age of the past. And we work with all of those specialists. Um, I work with geologists, I work with chemists, I work with people who specialize in diet and nutrition. I work with people who specialize in understanding the behavior of today's primates. And I work with cave explorers, people who are not scientists who really you know, are into exploring caves and, and working underground and sometimes in really dangerous places. I entered this field um, from my college career, I became an anthropology major because I was interested in understanding the way that ancient cultures and, and historic cultures interacted with each other. Um, I actually was an English major. I was studying English. And I wanted to, one of the ways that we study literature is by understanding the cultural setting that something was written in. So if you want to understand Shakespeare, you must understand something about England in the 1500s, right? That's a cultural question, right? What was this culture like? How is it different from what we understand today? How are cultures in the world different? And what do they share? Um, I got into bones uh, because I had the chance when I was in college to begin teaching about bones. And that was re really it reinforced to me that this was a career that I might choose. Um, but I work with colleagues who get into this for many different reasons. Um, human origins and our deep past is something that all of us around the world share. And there aren't so many things that everyone in the world can look at and say, we have this in common, right? We, today, you look around and you, people tend to emphasize the differences between people. I really love what I do because I'm studying what we have in common, what we share. Everywhere in the world that I've gone, the people that I talk with and the scientists that I work with, all of us share the same past. All of us come from the same place. And so understanding more about where we come from and what the world of our ancient ancestors was like gives us something that we can all hold in common today and that connects all of us. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, awesome. Great. We have our first question on the chat. Um, so the question itself is how long does the project take? And I think to give that a little more context, right? I, um, you know, you, I'm imagining are doing more than one project at a time. 
<laughs> and um, each part of your research is going to be a little bit different and you're probably going to have to work with different people and different expertise, but maybe let's focus first just on the work that you did um, with kind of the discovery in the initial um, analysis of Homo naledi. Yeah. A, you know, I'm working on a very complicated project, one that has many different elements where we have training that our team has to undertake, where we have, you know, ways that we have to interact with each other. I, I don't enter the parts of the cave system where bones are. And so I'm, you know, we have specialized ways of, of being able to communicate and talk with each other. And then in the laboratory, when we have fossils and artifacts that we work on, sometimes it's totally different people that are involved working on things and they may have different you know, constraints on their time. There may be some things that are super complicated. So this project has been underway for now um, nine years and will probably continue. That being said, there are parts of the project that we define as, you know, here's part of this and we're going to do this this year, right? This is this year's job. Um, that sometimes we get together and work for a month. So this summer, which is winter in South Africa, our team will be digging in the Rising Star Cave. We know that we're going to have an excavation that's going to last for less than six weeks. Um, so that's, you know, a very defined time, but that excavation may produce data that we'll be working on for a long time. Um, so the, the question then is really, you know, it varies. There are archeological projects that are very fast that take place in a year and you've generated the data. Even then it may take some additional time to write the results of what you've done, to publish the results of what you've done. But those are kind of short-term projects. There are other projects like the Cima de los Huesos project I talked about that has been going on since the late 1970s. This is 50 years that it's going on, right? Uh, since the discovery of the fossils and people have been working in the cave system every year since then and working on bones since then. Um, sometimes a project happens and it ends. And then later, because technology has developed, because our understanding of, of the archeological record has developed, new scientists go back and reopen a site and begin working again. Um, so sometimes we're working on sites that a hundred years ago, someone was working on and it hasn't been a hundred year long project, but it has returned because there's something new that we can learn. Yeah. And that's, I'm actually, I'm going to plug a little bit of the importance of museums here too, right? Like I work at the Milwaukee Public Museum and, um, we have a very large, we don't have a lot of large collections of, of human relatives, but we have a very large collection um, from all sorts of different types of, um, of science. We have botany and we have uh, anthropology and we have zoology, right? And um, just like Dr. Hawk said, you know, you can have a pretty set set project. You maybe dig something, you find something, um, and then you can learn so much from those things, um, even 50 years, even a hundred years later, and you need somewhere to, um, to keep those items and those objects uh, safe, right? And those specimens safe so that uh, you can go back or someone else much later than you can go back and learn a little bit more. Um, so it's a really good question asking kind of how long those projects take. Um, another question we have, is how big was the biggest skull that has been found? So okay. I don't know if you were thinking about like brain case, maybe like um, what human relative has the biggest brain case? There are living people that have skulls that are more than 2,500 cubic centimeters. That is, that is really big. That is like a liter more than the average person. Um, so, so there are people that have really big skulls. In the fossil record, we do have some skulls that are up to 1,800 to 2,000 cubic centimeters. Um, and you know, a population like the Neanderthals was a relatively large brain population. They were equal or slightly larger in brain size than today's people are. And we do have skulls of them that are as much as 500, 600 uh, milliliters, right? Bigger, so half a liter bigger than the average person. Um, however, brain size varies. There are totally normal people in, in terms of their behavior and way of thinking, 
who have brains that are smaller than a thousand cubic centimeters and really normal people who have brains that are bigger than 2000, right? So that's a big range. That's saying that somebody could be twice as big as somebody else. And you guys know this is true of humans. We vary in size. There are totally normal people who are less than five feet tall, they are four and a half feet tall and totally normal people that, you know, that are taller than seven feet tall. And that's a huge range of variation, right? There are people that weigh more than 300 pounds. There are people that weigh less than hundred pounds. We just vary a lot as a species. And some of that is because we notice, right? There's a lot of people around. And anytime you get a lot of people together, you're going to see a lot of variation, but also because there's a lot of different ways to live. And humans have adapted to our environments culturally. We have learned to think our way around problems. And that means that we can do that with really varied physical bodies. Um, and, and that's one of the really important things to understand about people, that there's a lot of variation in what you look like, but that doesn't mean that you're different in the way that you can learn and the way that you can do things. Right, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, wonderful, okay. Um, another question that we have, I like this question a lot, is what is the biggest question you still have about Holman Aledi that you hope to answer that isn't answered yet? That's a great question. Um, there are so many of them, right? If I say, what is the most urgent one, right? What are we working on now? We're working to understand if Naledi was burying its bodies in the cave system. And we have so many individuals, we have more than 20 individuals that we've found. Um, we have some connected parts of individuals. We know there are skeletons there. And so it's a natural question, right? Were they there because they got buried? And that's a tough one for us to answer. We have to look at a forensic type of, of evidence. It's not about what bones are there. It's about how are the bones placed? How are they arranged? Can we show that they're in a hole? You know, that kind of thing. So that's an urgent question and one that, that we've been thinking about a lot. But honestly, the biggest question that I have is when they talked to each other, when they communicated with each other, what was it like, right? Were they talking in a way that we could understand if we learned their language or were they using some different form of communication? Um, that's an important question because they are so different from us in what we understand about their brain size. It makes me wonder, were they adapted to talk with each other in some different kind of way? I love that. I I also love some of those questions that, you know, aren't always necessarily answered um, just by one, one line of thinking, but you know, what, what really were these people like? Um, so excellent. Uh, another question that I have is, um, so how do you know how old they were? Or maybe not. So how long ago they lived? Yeah. You know, how uh, that's, know a, that? that's an outstanding question. Uh, we use many lines of evidence today. Many of you have heard of carbon dating and carbon dating works on the principle that the atmosphere has radioactive carbon in it in a small fraction. That carbon is called carbon-14 because it has eight neutrons in the nucleus and six protons. That makes it weigh 14. Um, normal carbon, the most common form is, is carbon-12. Carbon-12 is stable, it, it's not radioactive. Carbon-14 is radioactive, it decays. Your body takes in carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14, and that carbon-14 that you take in continually decays after you die. Carbon-14 has a half-life, it lasts, half of it lasts 5,700 years. And so over that time, half of it's gone. Over the next 5,000 years, half of it's gone. It's continually going away. So if you find that there's a little bit of carbon-14 in ancient bones, you can usually figure out their age. However, that only works as long as there's carbon-14 left. And by the time you get back to 50,000 years ago, that's 10 half-lives, there's so little of the carbon-14 left that we can't measure it accurately anymore. And so what do we do for older things? In our site, we use five different methods, but two of them have been especially important to us. One of those uses the fact that teeth are made of small crystals. Your teeth 
are made of little tiny crystals. And those crystals are laid down by special cells called ameloblasts. And those special cells lay down these crystals in a wavy texture. And any kind of crystal, if it's exposed to radiation, will trap electrons in little defects of the crystal. And we can measure the amount of the trapped electrons using a special electron electrical device and estimate from that how long the tooth has been exposed to radiation. Now you say, what radiation? <laughs> in fact, everywhere on earth has radiation. And in particular, the groundwater has radiation in it because uranium is soluble in water. So groundwater everywhere on earth has some level of uranium. In Wisconsin, that level is fairly high. And, and that is one reason why if you buy a house or if you live in an older house, you may have had radon testing done. The radon in your house is coming from radioactive decay of uranium in the water beneath your house. And radon is a gas, so it percolates upwards. This is a low enough level in nature that it's not a problem for our health. It's only a problem in your house if there's so much radon gas that's come up that it creates you know, a problem. But over thousands and thousands of years, that low level of radiation does leave a trace in the crystals of your teeth. And that trace we can measure. And so that's one of the main ways that we know how old Naledi is. The other way is directly from uranium. Because we're in a cave and caves, you know, have dripping water and leave little layers of calcite, those little layers of calcite have uranium in them. And the uranium decays over time after it's deposited, it decays into thorium. And thorium is also a radioactive element. It doesn't stick around forever, but the level of uranium compared to thorium gives us a way of figuring out how old the little layers of calcite are. And we have a piece of calcite that formed on top of a Naledi bone. So we actually have a place where we can say this calcite formed after the bones were deposited. And that gives us the 236,000. It says the bones were there before this. That, that is so cool. And I also really love the fact, again, that there are so many different ways that you can um, you know, enter this field in, in you know, having uh, knowledge in maybe radiometric dating or something like that. And I also think it's cool that there are lots of different ways that you can measure the same thing and, and see, uh, you know, make sure that they match up too. Um, all right, we are kind of quickly running out of time, but I do have another question in the chat. Uh, it says, how old are the oldest remains that you've found? The oldest remains of a human relative are about 7 million years old. And I have, I didn't find those, but I have worked on them. The oldest remains that I have found are a little over two and a half million years old. And, and I would say, when I say I, right, I'm always involved with a team. And so I could say that right, it's always teamwork. There are fossils that I myself have picked up off the ground or in a cave and they are that old, right? So, so that is, you know, those are the ones I work on. Um, but I'll tell you, when I grew up in Kansas, the fossils that I picked up off the side of the road were much older than any that I work on today, right? Those shark's teeth are 80 million years old. And so it's easy to find much older things. It's hard to find the things that I'm looking for. And now uh, what species was the, the oldest, the oldest remains, oldest specimens that you found? I'll you tell you a them. secret. I'll tell you a secret. We're not sure what species they are yet. <laughs> Oh, that's so exciting. <laughs> that's so exciting. To me, that I get even more excited when we don't know things yet. That's the fun thing about science is that you find the things that you don't know and that's then right. you have even more questions. That's amazing. Yep. Oh, that's so exciting. That's a good one to end on, maybe. <laughs> um, so I want to thank everybody so much for joining us. Uh, I had a great time. I learned super, you know, I learned a lot. I had a super amount of fun. Um, and I also want us to thank Dr. Hawks because uh, he has been so generous with his time with us answering our questions, which, um, you know, is, is super great. We can, we can learn so much from so many different people. I want to thank you guys. I want to thank Dr. Hawks. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, and I hope to see you at our next Learn with an Expert. Uh, thanks guys so much. Have a good one.
All right, and the stream has ended.